Welcome everybody to our second in seven presentations for the permanent public art along the Del Rio Trail here in Sacramento, California. We're really thrilled to have you all with us today. Uh, today, we're going to have a presentation uh, for their design proposal from Singer Studio. And just thrilled to have been working with Jonathan and Michael and, and, and Jason and the team to see their development through this project. My name is Donald Gensler. I run our Art and Public Places program through the uh, Office of Arts and Culture. Joined today with uh, Beth Jones and Linda, Linda Jolly, who are uh, consultants with Beth Jones Art Consulting, working with us on this project. And also doing some tech support in the background is Diana Rufner from our office. So thank you all for being here to uh, assist through the process. As I think many of you know, um, this is recorded and we'll be posting probably within the next day or two, each of the recordings get up after the presentation onto our Office of Arts and Culture YouTube website. So if you missed Janet Swig's presentation yesterday, that should be uploaded by the end of the day today or first thing tomorrow. And we'll continue uh, with presentations through this week and next week. Uh, tomorrow, I believe, will be Atlas Lab. So be sure to tune in for that. So I'm going to keep this relatively brief. Um, the purpose here is that it's a kind of one hour, 12 p.m. to 1 p.m., uh, brown bag lunch style uh, presentation. So our hope is that people can tune in, get a sense of the design proposals that are happening. And if you have some comments or thoughts or excitement about it, whatever you wanna share, that would be really wonderful. We'd love to hear it. And I know the artists would love to hear it as well. Uh, with no kind of further delay, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce Singer Studio. Um, they were selected out of over 120 applicants around the country. Uh, and our selection panel selected them to create one of five what well, we termed wayfinding locations throughout the Del Rio Trail, which is almost five mile trail from uh, Pocket Road all the way up to Riverside Boulevard, then connecting in Sacramento and then connecting to existing trails along the river. Uh, I'm gonna introduce first uh, for Singer Studio, Michael Singer. Uh, he, through the 70s and 80s, his work opened new possibilities for outdoor and indoor sculpture and contributed to the definition of site-specific art and a reimagining of, of public spaces. He's received, received numerous awards and fellowships from the NEA to the uh, Guggenheim Foundation. And uh, along with Michael today is Jonathan uh, uh, Fogelson, uh, who is a partner with the studio as well. Jonathan is a, mis a multidisciplinary designer and planner and uh, with experiences ranging from mold making for glass slumping and hands-on construction. Uh, he's led a number of projects with uh, Singer Studio uh, and he also continues current collaborations with the University of Connecticut on community-based green infrastructure planning and implementation. Uh, and Jonathan lectures regularly on the topics, most recently as a keynote speaker at the annual conferences Geo Forum uh, and Israeli Ministry of Environmental Protection. So that's a very quick uh, uh, introduction of an artist team that has really dove into the concept around this trail and all the possibilities that might come out of it. So really thrilled to have uh, Singer Studio present today. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to you all. Thank you. Thank you, Donald. Um, and, and thank you all for including Singer Studios, Studio in the, in the work for the Del Rio Trail um, and also being part of the collection of artists doing work along the trail. That's a very, that's a newer perspective for us and very helpful and, and fascinating to watch and see how this all evolves. There's a lot we want to show you, and I'm going to hand this off to my studio colleague, Jonathan Fogelson, who will go through our presentation. 
and um, and I, I I will be available. We'll both be available for questions afterwards. Thank you, Jonathan. Why don't you go forward? Thank you. So so again, one of the things that we think is really exciting about this opportunity is to work alongside other artists. Um, uh, you know, multiple multiple artists working along this one trail. And what's really exciting for us about that is not just the permanent artworks that will be there, but also some of the more ephemeral art related activity and artworks that might not necessarily be permanently installed on site that are part of the greater effort. And we really want to compliment the city of uh, Sacramento for having a, a really interesting approach on, on how to get the most bang out of the out of the art buck, so to speak, in, on this kind of effort. Uh, it, it really is very interesting to see this unfold. Um, uh, we're kind of on the inside, but we're kind of on the outside. So we get to look at it a few different perspectives. Uh, if it's OK, I'll just go ahead and share my screen and begin the presentation. I'm actually going to start with a three minute video. Um, introducing our studio in general and kind of showing some footage from actually where we are right now. We're in Michael's studio uh, that's located in southern Vermont. So uh, we're in the middle of the woods right now. And I think fast internet came to us maybe about 18 to 24 months ago. So this is all very exciting for us to be able to teleconference. So uh, here we go. Um, Michael Singer has created site-specific sculptures for over 45 years and has had several one-person shows, most notably at the Guggenheim Museum in New York City and most recently in Denmark at the Utsan Center in Aalborg and the Danish Architectural Copenhagen. Singer founded his collaborative studio over 25 years ago to advance increasingly complex designs that sculpt public spaces. Reimagine infrastructure and regenerate landscapes. Michael Singer Studio has been instrumental in transforming public art, urban spaces, landscapes and infrastructure projects into successful models for urban and ecological regeneration. The studio's integrated works of art have been noted for their unique regenerative qualities with projects shaped to restore environmental function through their collective realization. Many studio projects have intricate layers of materials and are seen as a gradual co-evolution with Singer's earlier installations and sculptures. Operating as an open, interdisciplinary collaborative, the studio focuses on innovative and transformative design, functional aesthetics, and ecological and social renewal. All right, thank you for that. Hopefully that was helpful a little bit in, in uh, sharing a little bit of the uh, context of where we are and the kind of work that we're doing. And um, for uh, the city of Sacramento and the Del Rio Trail, we're, we're imagining a project that we call avian gantries. Uh, and in a moment, you'll see the, the relevance of those two words uh, in the name. Um, this is the kind of cover page of the official submission that we gave the city just about a, a short few, few days ago. 
uh, as part of our work uh, for the project. Uh, we're currently completed the concept level design for the project, and we're looking forward to continuing to the next phase of design. Um, just a couple extra, uh, a couple extra words on some previous projects. This is uh, as an exam, uh, as examples. This is a project we completed uh, at the Austin International Airport. It's approximately a four, a constructed four, four, four hundred foot plus long landscape. Um, of precast concrete components that are uh, literally hung from the overhead steel structure uh, with cabling. There's a long story that goes with this. And if I get too deep into this, we won't have any time to talk about our project with you guys. So I'm just going to keep going. Um, uh, this is a project we completed uh, just about three years ago um, in Maryland, a new university building. It includes an outdoor sculpted uh, garden uh, pond that uh, circulates rainwater. Um, as well as a kind of indoor green wall, uh, which is which is part of the the interior space of the building, uh, featuring uh, cast concrete and cast aluminum components. Um, this is a project that was actually in, uh, briefly shown in the video that we shared with you, the sculptural sem the seminal sculptural wall. It's a biofiltration system. It actually filters one hundred and fifty thousand gallons of storm water from ponds on site at this Florida location. Um, it's an example of a public art project that serves an immediate, literal, and direct environmental function. Uh, this is a project I could talk about for about two and a half hours, so I'm just going to leave it at that. Uh, this is one of our most recent projects. We completed about a year and a half ago in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Uh, downtown Chattanooga, Chattanooga, Tennessee. It's a two long, uh, two block long project in downtown. And actually, within some of these uh, landscape uh, precast concrete sculpted components, uh, there's stormwater circulating and aerating. Again, improving uh, water quality before it gets released into the Tennessee River. It was a pretty interesting project for us to work on in collaboration with a bunch of local uh, engineers and landscape architects. Um, and to uh, the the Del Rio Trail and and the history of the site and the relics and remnants that are on site right now and will remain on site, we're very much excited by the nature of the aesthetic vernacular of the, the kind of somewhat utilitarian structures uh, related to uh, trains and, and train tracks and associated bridges and, and, and ancillary structures, including gantries. We're also very much excited by the materiality of it, uh, the notion of this kind of patinated, and warm uh, carbon steel that that you know becomes very much part of the landscape and, and very much kind of relates to the areas around it is something that that we found really interesting aesthetically and 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 interestingly uh, regarding uh, carbon steel it's something that you know surrounds us every day in any number of places including in public art the, the project on the right is actually in fact a series of bent rails uh, turned into a public art uh, piece as, as part of a rail to trail project, not too dissimilar than the Del Rio project. Uh, this one is in uh, in South Australia. Uh, so so we 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 found the, that the actual materiality as being something uh, uh, really re really uh, that we were drawn to, uh, kind of working with the vernacular, the formal vernacular of, of the train, uh, if you will. Another thing that very much excited us is actually. Uh, uh, Sacramento itself and its location. Sacramento is located along the Pacific Flyway at a very strategic location in the Sacramento and San Joaquin River Valleys as, as, as part of the San Francisco Bay. And it's actually a very well-known waypoint for uh, migrating birds along the Pacific Flyway, one of the most important flyways in the world. Upon digging into this narrative deeper, we discovered that there's a big difference between what we might all consider nature in its pristine sense and, and the nature that we have in urban locations, um, which is very different. Um, and, and so what one might expect to see along the Pacific Flyway as an expert bird watcher, shall we say, is not necessarily what one would see inside an urban environment along the Pacific Flyway. Actually, the urban ecology is very different from the ecology that surrounds urban locations. Uh, and because of the close proximity that human beings have to the urban ecology, what's really most important about the urban ecology is it's people experience nature, albeit an urban version of nature, but nevertheless nature. Um, the 
the types of species that one would expect to see in an urban location um, is different than what you'd expect to see in the pristine version of nature. And here is a list of um, the types of bird species one would expect to see in an urban location uh, in your region of California. And um, these are not necessarily native birds or invasive birds or non-invasive birds as, as one might, may or may not call them. These are the bird types that are prevalent in urban areas in your region of California and, and differ than what one would see if they drive an hour and a half towards the coast or an hour up to the mountains. They're particular and unique to Sacramento and other urban locations. What's really interesting about this is if we actually accept the urban ecology as something that has value, um, also ecologically, but also from an educational perspective, we can appreciate the fact that a wider variety of people on a more daily basis can come in contact with nature, learn from nature, appreciate nature, and hopefully in the long run, policies that protect nature, preserve nature, and keep us all going. Uh, this is a snapshot from a website from one of the citizen, um, citizen scientist programs at the Cornell University uh, Ornithology Laboratory, which one is the, one of the uh, most uh, uh, respected ornithology uh, labs worldwide. In fact, it's explicitly and deliberately a multicultural and, and bilingual um, effort to engage people that live at a in a, across a large swaths of different types of locations from rural to urban and everything in between to engage in bird watching, even in the urban environment. And uh, there are a lot of resources out there about the value of bird watching and the value of experiencing nature, even if it's just in our backyard, even if it's just around the corner from where we live. You don't necessarily have to go out in nature. You don't necessarily have to have the resources to travel four hours out into the wilderness to explore nature. You can do that right on your walk from home to school and back. Um, and we think that that's something that's really special to acknowledge. Um, and, and, uh, and what we're actually left, what we then went and did is we, we did a little bit more research about those birds that are prevalent in your area. And we figured out what are some of the design principles that we can utilize, and I'm not going to go over all this entire table, what are some of the design principles that we can utilize to help those birds that are available locally, that exist locally, and, and support them so that kids walking to school, senior citizens taking a walk, people on a jog are more likely than not to experience them. Um, and we came up with a design that provides for nesting boxes at towering some 12 to 15 feet above the Del Rio Trail, uh, dotted along the trail at several locations within our segment. We're called, we're in what's called a segment three of the Del Rio Trail. Um, and, and the idea for this sculptural structure is that it offers the opportunity for the birds that are prevalent in Sacramento to nest within and be present, admittedly, periodically, they don't nest year, year long, um, but also speaks to the, vernacular, the structural vernacular, the formal language, and the materiality uh, that relate to the history of the place itself. Um, uh, of course, uh, the people over here in this little drawing are computer generated people, they're not real people. These are just kind of initial drawings. This is all concept level work. Um, the, uh, another thing that we thought was pretty interesting about this is because of the north-south orientation of the Del Rio Trail, during most of the afternoon, the sun will cast a relatively interesting and dynamic shadow uh, from the structure onto the ground, onto the trail itself. Uh, and here you can actually see this kind of top view, if you will, a bird's eye view. Uh -huh. um, you, can, you can see over here on the top left, the, the purpose is for the structure to actually be installed directly onto the existing rails that are intended to be preserved on site. Uh, for those of you that may not know, along the vast majority of the Del Rio Trail, the tracks will remain in sight, which is a really, really fascinating piece of the whole story of the Del Rio Trail, of course. Um, the, we're, we're anticipating at this point for the structure to be made out of patinated carbon steel, so it'll have that kind of deep reddish uh, patina. Um, 
We're also expecting it to include sculpted cast panels. And um, I'll show you a couple sample of those in, in, in just a few slides down the road. Um, and then uh, the structure will include two handcrafted solid cedar wood nesting boxes, which you're kind of seeing at the top left at two different locations. Uh, these also will have uh, sculpted cast panels uh, uh, kind of offering additional decoration to them. There's going to be a certain amount of irregularity that's part of the nature of the material itself, as well as the nature of the handcrafted uh, uh, design uh, for these nesting boxes. If you look at these nesting boxes a bit, a bit uh, more closely, you'll see that, you know, you'll see different uh, opening sizes, you'll see different ledges right out board of them. You'll see that some of them face to the south, some of them face to the east, some of them face to the north. That's actually all directly related to that table a few slides back of various bird species in Sacramento, in urban areas in the Sacramento area, wanting to have their nesting box face a certain direction, wanting to have their nesting box face a certain direction away from the wind or towards the sun, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and, and have different elevations that are preferred to them, different hole sizes that may or may not be preferred to them. So this is all actually driven by that. And um, some of the details on the bottom of this page are kind of in the works details. And uh, on the left, you can see how we might attach to the train track itself. Instead of having to actually go ahead and build a foundation, we're planning on attaching our structure to the train track itself. And then on the bottom right, some kind of, I, I, I tend to geek out on structural stuff. This is a, a, a series of ways to kind of let the installers properly level and plumb everything. So that's kind of the type of stuff that I really enjoy figuring out. Um, um, in terms of location, um, Depending on final costs of materials and fabrication and installation, we don't know exactly how many of these we're going to be able to afford. Um, our segment of the Del Rio Trail runs from Fruit Ridge Road at the north all the way down to 43rd Avenue on the south. Um, so you kind of see on the left Fruit Ridge Road and on the right hand side at 43rd uh, Avenue um, and the red dots representing the potential locations where we're envisioning our avian gantry structures to be located so hopefully we'll be able to afford five or even more of them uh, but if we need to bring it back down to to four or even three we we kind of have a, a good idea of what would be strategic locations to maximize their visibility and maximize their spread along the site um, just for reference, uh, at the northern end of our site between 35th and Fruit Ridge, that's where the municipal water treatment plant is. Uh, sorry, uh, um, uh, it's not the water treatment plant. I apologize. It's the um, it's the Department of Public Works, uh, which are very much involved uh, in this project. Um, about some of the materiality for the project and some of the detailing for this project. Um, most of the images um, on this slide have, are, are actually from a project that we installed in, uh, in Toronto, a very large urban park in Toronto. Um, and, and you see here the type of assembly and the type of relationships between components that's somewhat uh, related to what you've seen up until now in this presentation. Um, metal components with cast, uh, sculpted cast panels welded to them. That's pretty much what we're envisioning. Uh, you see on the bottom, uh, on the bottom right, and then at the bottom center, these are these are actually kind of samples of uh, of cast cast. In this case, cast aluminum sculpt panels. I'm I'm actually holding one right now. If you if you can see uh, if you can see what what you know if you can see the small thumbnail of my uh, with my with my face in it, then you're also you're seeing a little sample of a a piece of sculpted cast metal uh, panel. Um, we're envisioning, of course, all of this being uh, made out of carbon steel for this project, as you can see in the photo that I took on site on a particularly rainy weekend at the bottom right of the screen. Among the grass, you see a, a pile of the rails. Uh, those are actually rails uh, at the Del Rio uh, Trail, at least as of March, if I'm not mistaken, or February when I was there for a visit and I got to experience the site myself. Um, the reason uh, um, um, uh, uh, the reason uh, we're kind of getting into some of these details is because we think that it's important for people to have a pretty good understanding of what things are going to be like up close in person, because people are going to be up close in person to this. And we take great care to make sure that people can touch things, people can get pretty intimate with the work in terms of their physical proximity to it, experience it from far away and from close up. Um, 
This hasn't been engineered yet, and it's very possible that our engineer is going to come back and say that we might need to limit the weight, we might need to adjust the sizing of some of our structural members. Um, they might tell us that that we need to move the center, uh, the you know, the, the the center of mass of the piece to be at a lower location. We'll see how this all pans out. We don't know, but we're already well well ahead, moving forward, and kind of have them ready to go to begin the engineering process. If necessary, uh, if if weight becomes an issue for this project, because Sacramento is in a seismic zone and we do need to respect that, and the weight of our, our proposal needs to come down significantly, then we'll probably transition from carbon steel to an aluminum structure, aluminum being at less than half the weight of steel. Um, this is the timeline uh, that we need to we need to meet. It's very important that the project is completely done uh, before the end of June. Uh, so uh, from our perspective, I'm sure also from the perspective of the city, that one of the biggest challenges for this project really is the timeline, which is driven by the state. Um, it's a state requirement, a pretty aggressive timeline to actually build a permanent uh, construction out in a public location. Um, our, our hope is that during the month of August, the city will formally approve our artwork and will be under our next contract to advance the design and then very quickly at the beginning of the fall to, to move into what's known as design development, which is the next phase of design and, and wrap up construction documents and directly move into fabrication as quickly as possible. This next phase called design development, DD, we actually kind of already started it, but don't tell everybody at work because they're going to be upset with me that I started working too far ahead before we have the next contract. Uh, but I'm optimistic, and I want to get a jump start on the next phase of work. Um, one thing that that we're thinking of is how to make sure that when the time comes to actually assemble this, it can be done in an effective way, and we don't find ourselves uh, with with delays having to do with installation. So, as part of our design, we're thinking very carefully about how things can be reasonably broken down into pieces that are easy to ship, easy to carry, easy to assemble. Um, we wanna make sure that our work isn't quote unquote, only aesthetically pleasing and, and hopefully meaningful uh, uh, to residents and visitors, um, but rather also something that's ultimately relatively practical to implement. Um, uh, an important thing to, to note in, in part of the conclusion is that, you know, bird, bird nesting is temporary. Birds don't nest uh, year round. Um, at the maximum extent of nesting in the Sacramento area would be from April to mid-August. So we're not talking about the majority of the year. Uh, and it can be sporadic, it can be inconsistent. It may very well even be absent. Um, that's important to point out. We're not guaranteeing birds. We can't guarantee birds. Uh, of course, this project isn't going to be managed by an ornithologist. It's simply not reasonable to expect the city to be able to do that. We accept that. We recognize that. We hope also that that constituents and residents and and visitors will be able to to accept that. It's it's important to be to be sensible about this. And and from our perspective, really, what matters most is that just by people understanding what it is and what it can be. And the fact that there are nesting boxes permanently installed in the public realm, integrated into an artwork, uh, to us, that's really meaningful because it opens the possibility for those kinds of discussions. And it opens the possibilities for people to be interested in what's going on in the urban ecology. And, and if it does just a shred of that to one person, then, then we consider ourselves successful. Uh, and hopefully you'll do a little bit more than that for more than one person. And hopefully people will agree that it's an interesting uh, series of sculpted components, uh, sculpted features to, to kind of be a part of the larger collection along the Del Rio Trail. I have plenty of time for questions. Um, I don't know if you, if I should stop sharing the screen. Um, yeah, let's Beth, Linda, let, Donald, what do you yeah, all think? Let's stop this share and then you could always bring bring it back up if if there are some specific questions. Thank you, Thank Jonathan. You. Thank, you. Thank you very much. This was really excellent. Um, and I appreciate you giving that whole arc of both the work that you all do at Singer Studio to how this you know concept developed for you. Just to you know, just to comment quickly on your last um a uh, last bit of content that you were discussing, you know, from a from a city's perspective and from an art and public places perspective. I also we, 
you know, we're supportive of our artists and art, you know, for art's sake, right? For the sculpture itself. However, I do love that you all have um, in, in your research taken the time to really think about this element of birds and nesting um, because, you know, like you said, whether birds actually nest there or not, uh, we will have actually I was just talking with some of the folks in public works today about our kind of campaign of signage, both way, additional wayfinding signage and also kind of historical markers and signage that will help, um, you know, as people travel along the trail. So we absolutely could have a sign that, you know, lists the different type of birds that you showed there. And I think there's a wonderful educational component uh, to it. So um, for, for us, that's a really nice feature of what you're investigating, that of course you're creating a form that, that, that is quite interesting, but also you know, you'll bring some, some light and interest to this idea of, of birds and bird nesting and ornithology um, in, here in the Sacramento community. So thank you for that. I, at this point, what we would really like to do is you know, open up for some discussion or questions uh, and just have that kind of space. I'll, I have some questions myself. Uh, and but but if anybody has questions they'd like to put in the chat or, you know, just um, if you want to just uh, start uh, talking or do a raise your hand function, whatever works for you. This really is an informal opportunity for us to just you know, bounce ideas off of you and, um, you know, kind of uh, give some thoughts as to uh, the direction of your project. Um, so with that, does anybody have any? Steven, yes. Hi, listen, I have to run, but I just wanted to say that Michael, we worked together back at the Newberger Museum. I was the oh. chief curator and I lit your, I lit your work oh. and, uh, it's really an, an honor and a privilege to uh, be one of the artists with you uh, on this on this project. And congratulations, uh, Donald and everybody, for um, bringing in Singer Studio. Thank you, thank you, Stephen. Thank you, thank you, Stephen. Thank and you. Uh, be sure nice everybody to, to check out Stephen Glassman's presentation <laughs> next week, right, Stephen? Uh, is it Monday? Uh, yes, Monday. Monday, Monday next week, twelve p.m. Yes. So thanks very much, Stephen. All right. I'm, Got I'm to gonna go. Thanks. I'm going to respond to uh, Sherman's uh, a question here. He says, the rails that overlap in your design, are they welded or bolted together? That's a that's a great question. Thank you uh, for, for that question. That's actually something we went back and forth on quite a bit. Uh, we have to admit, <laughs> at, at this point, um, first of all, it's important to note that they're actually not rails per se. Um, we were, uh, when we first started designing the project, we were hopeful that we'd be able to get a significant stock of, of leftover decommissioned rail material to work with. Um, but that, that ended up not working out. And apparently for good reason, uh, because our engineer explained to us that a rail being an asymmetric member is actually very difficult to design with. And, and apparently rails are really difficult to drill into and nearly impossible to weld uh, to because it's a particular type of extra hard steel. I, I didn't know that, but I learned something every day. Uh, so so the, the structural, the primary structural members for the, the um, avian gantry structures are actually a four inch by two inch structural steel tube. Um, and, and we like that size because it has a certain amount of kind of heft to it visually, but it's not overwhelming. It doesn't start looking like a bridge. And then from a very practical reason, the reason we like it is because it's the single steel member that comes with the greatest variety of wall thicknesses. So if our engineer tells us, oh, this can be is as flimsy as a 16th of an inch, then that's great. We save a lot of money on material. But if our engineer says, oh, this needs to be much thicker, well, we can go ahead and buy exactly the same aesthetically looking piece at quarter inch thick, for example. So uh, the, what you refer to, sir, is the rails are actually four by two uh, extruded, hot rolled uh, carbon steel uh, structural members. 
And um, at this point, we're looking to them being bolted to each other. So where they overlap, they overlap a minimum of 12 to 16 inches, such that there's enough room for two, and if necessary, three, pending engineering, bolt locations. Um, all bolting in areas that are easily accessible to the visiting public are actually going to be tamper resistant, uh, uh, are going to be treated with tamper resistant uh, means, whether kind of breakaway uh, bolts, what's known as breakaway bolts, or bolts that have a, a hexagonal shape to them, we'll see exactly what works out. We've been doing quite a bit of research on this. We've used we've used uh, different types of um, tamper resistant bolts with, with good success in other projects. And we're confident that it's going to work out in this project as well. We do believe that it's very important that a project of this nature is, from a structural perspective, tamper resistant. Uh, so, so, um, the, and, and interestingly, bolting is actually stronger than welding. So, we, we like the bolting because it's stronger than welding. We like the bolting because it makes the assembly on site easier. And um, we, we also like the bolting because it kind of emphasizes that, that aesthetic look and feel of the layering of the silk and the fastening of them together. And those are all things that we're pretty much interested in from, a, from an aesthetic and artistic perspective. And, and you know, luckily, it also works out practically. Uh, so, so that's nice. One one of the one of the things also I appreciate about your your design is um, that it it kind of harkens towards this this type of machine that feels like it was kind of part of the railway at some to some extent, but of course wasn't right. And so I, I think it it rides that interesting line between like a form that feels familiar. And because I know you did look at, you know, older, like different railway kind of construction and things like that. And so, but without just mimicking that, right? So you didn't just literally mimic a, an existing structure, but you you kind of reconfigured it and, and made it very much also within that kind of singer studio aesthetic. It, it does also hearken to uh, some of your other work, which is really, of course, I think always nice to see. Um, Let's see, wildlife biologist. Did did you consult with a wildlife biologist in the design of the birdhouses? Some birds enter through a hole and floor, and this is typically birds that inhabit Caltrans bridges. That's um, a great question. Yes. Yeah. Yes, so I'll, I'll, let, I'll let you respond to that first. Yeah. So we we actually we actually consulted with with a couple different uh, avian specialists. Um, um, one one was a, actually a, a a local a local individual with uh, with. Uh, Sacramento chapter of the Audubon Society. We're still in conversation with them. And I'm looking forward to my next visit to the site to actually meet them in person and learn some more in person while walking the site, uh, while walking the site with them. So, so that's that's one individual we've been in touch with. Another person that we've been in touch with is actually uh, a doctor of biology at, with the uh, Fish and Wildlife um, uh, Service. And, uh, and and his particular interest is birds and birds in urban locations. And uh, and the current design that we have is actually something that I shared and discussed with him, um, as well as shared with the various resources that we found in our, in our literature view, just to make sure that what we're proposing is sound. Um, what was really interesting to me about that conversation was uh, his attitude, uh, the, the, the fish and wildlife uh, experts attitude was very much the attitude of, if you will build it, they will come. And that was very much his attitude, which is you know, diff different than, than the attitude of, of, of uh, what would be a kind of you know, bird watcher in, in the pristine version of nature, right? And what, what he, he really opened my eyes up to the if you will the biologist's attitude uh, towards a lot of Michael's work that goes back many years and our our shared work in in the studio uh, this idea of finding ways to visually expose natural systems and ecological systems whether that exposure is literally and directly environmentally functional or whether that exposure is quote unquote only exposure 
and becomes a, a talking piece that helps people converse and understand better. Um, and, and to me, what was really interesting about the conversation with the biologist from, from the Fish and Wildlife Service was, was his attitude as a biologist was kind of pretty much that. He said, he said to me, in not so many words, he said to me, listen, you're in an urban location. Um, it's an ecological environment that we created. It wouldn't exist if it weren't for people. What we will see in those locations isn't what we're going to see an hour and a half, two hours away from the city. And what we're going to see in those locations, the most important value that it has is that we as humans saw it and experienced it and then talked about it. That's what really matters. Uh, so he said, whether it's going to be a, a, an American kestrel or whether it's going to be a barn swallow, he's like, that doesn't matter all that much. As long as something is around or as long as people see the, the nesting box, get excited by it and talk about it, even if they never saw a bird. Uh, so, so that was a kind of interesting uh, a series of conversations to have with somebody from a completely different discipline than my own, that very much complemented our overall attitude. So that was that was interesting. Uh, one of the one of the nice things about uh, working in this field is that you never know what you're doing, so you're always learning from other people. Uh, and the, the, those the, those two series of conversations were very much educational, and 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 they're not over. By the way, those conversations are not over. Um, there's a level of refinement and, and detailing to the materiality that needs to come into play. Um, and then there's also certain uh, sensitivity to the specifics of the site itself, which I'm, I'm looking forward to sussing out at my next, my next visit. Uh, hopefully, you know, as soon as uh, the second half of August, I'll be able to walk the again along with my, my local ornithology expert from the, from the um, Sacramento chapter of the Audubon Society. So definitely looking forward to learning more about all that for sure. Thanks, Jonathan. I, you know, I'll uh, uh, just add that, um, I'll just add that, you know, from, from our perspective, I, I, I mean, that you, you, I mean, you really touched on it. I think we're we're really looking for you making to make artwork. If there is, you know, a, an opportunity, you know, for bird nesting or whatever, potentially, um, the, the the more that the important thing is also the the larger conversation around bird habitat and bird life uh, within Sacramento um, that it can be part of that. So looking forward to working with you on that, and hopefully it sparks opportunities for dialogue. Uh, maybe even some kind of panel discussion or something like that around um, your larger concepts and how they fit into um, how they fill in, fit into the, the the space of the the Del Rio Trail. Um, so that's great. Um, any other um, any other uh, comments or questions? I'll um, I'll jump in, but please feel free to raise your hand or um, or write something in the in the chat. Uh, one of the things I wanted to uh, uh, point out is your um, you, the detailing is quite exquisite in terms of how you bolt onto the track, and um, and and that was important uh, for us uh, because the track is historic, and so it gives it an opportunity to um, to really bolt onto that existing structure. Um, and, um, and, and we appreciate all the work that went into that. One of the conversations was, you know, could it be welded instead of bolted? And, and so that, that type of construction, that type of detailing, I think is something for those folks that are listening and watching this presentation, you know, just to be aware of, uh, that, uh, that there's a lot of, there was a lot of design aspects that went into how this piece will actually be installed on the existing rails and also preserve that bit of history. Um, to, to really recognize the the importance of the history of the of the of the rail uh, and the trains um, uh, here through Sac through Sacramento, um, I'll bring up something else that we've discussed. You know, we and we we're concerned. You know, we're always looking at this from all perspectives, but certainly climbability and things like that were something that Singer Studio looked into. We're looking into that with all the sculptures in in all the work we do here in the city. Um, anything that. Um, you know, to make sure that think structures are safe. Um, of course, you know, we're not, you know, nobody should be climbing sculptures, um, but we did, uh, they, they did spend a good amount of time, Jonathan spent a good amount of time looking into how those rails of oh, those, those 
members could be kind of organized to where they would be <laughs> more difficult if, if somebody was to attempt something like that. Uh, you also, while you'll be able to kind of walk underneath and through or, or walk around the sculpture, you won't necessarily be able to like kind of bike through it or anything like that. And that was important because we, again, while we want people to appreciate the art, we want people to be to be safe. Uh, um, and, um, and I just wanted to kind of point out that all of that went into part of the discussion there as well. Great. Any other questions or, or comments for uh, Jonathan and Michael? Just would love to say, I think the design is spectacular and the sculptural form is gonna be with or without birds, um, just delightful, surprising, exciting. The scale's great. Um, and I love how it looks organically coming out of the track, like I think Donald mentioned, but also looks like it just came straight from a creative mind. So I, I just can't mm -hmm. wait to see them installed. I, I was going to add that all the little birdies out there that love Blade Runner, I think they're going to flock to your houses. Okay. That's good one. Yeah. Great design. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. One other thing to point out, and, and we we separated this out in the grant, you know, this is funded through the state of California, uh, managed through our Department of Transportation, Caltrans, and then um, our, our city was awarded a, a, a grant to be able to um, work with all these wonderful artists. Um, one of the aspects of this um, uh, singer studio was one of five groups chosen or five artists chosen to create kind of wayfinding work. And, um, and you know, there's been a lot of different approaches to wayfinding, um, some in more series, some in less series, some very tall so that you can see it and that that becomes the wayfinding element. Um, but one thing that is really has also always been, and I know there's some question and, and we're still getting into the engineering and that, that's fine. You, you know, Singer Studio has been in touch with us about this. You're trying to figure out where the costs are going to be in terms of how many in a series are possible. Um, but I do think that this idea that you're traveling along the trail and that you see one of your structures and you keep going and you see another one will give you a sense that you're in a cer certain portion of the trail um, that I hope, my hope is that people will come to, you know, know those areas through those different sculpture uh, portions of the trail. Um, so thank you for contributing to that. Um, I do think uh, if, if, as many as are possible in series, I think it's quite beautiful. Um, but uh, we certainly are, you know, we'll work with you to figure out what's uh, possible. I had one question about as they are in series, right? So whether there's three or four, or five, whatever it works out to, will there be slight variations in each one, even just in how they're oriented, or do you foresee them being, um, you know, facsimiles of the of the same? That, that that's a really good question. So we're we're the, the intent is for them to be the same. Okay. Um, and the variation will be primarily uh, in, in kind of some of the patina and modeling on the material, which, which is always the case, right? Um, as well as in the wooden uh, nesting boxes themselves. So the majority of the structure, as, as you all may recall, is a, is a metal supporting structure. But then up at the top, we have these two wooden nesting boxes. Those wooden nesting boxes are going to be handcrafted in our Vermont studio out of cedar wood, and, and cast aluminum as sculpted panels. And there will be more variety within those portions of the work. Um, variety in terms of the, the, the finish of the material, the nature of the material, the modeling of the material. Another thing that's important to note is that we expect for the work to continue to age in place. Um, so the wood is gonna get darker and darker and darker over time. Some portions of the wood might get a little bit lighter over time because of UV exposure. The, the steel patina is gonna continue darkening and darkening. It won't, it won't rust through, so to speak, but, but things continue aging and kind of melting and kind of becoming one with the place itself. 
And we expect to see some variation in that. Um, they are, because of the nature of the tracks, they are all going to have the same orientation. Um, and that orientation is also uh, important in terms of the what direction the nesting box openings face. So uh, we're actually leveraging the consistency of the orientation to could help you, better manage what the birds actually need. Could you just, in the last couple of minutes that we have here, could you just um, maybe share that design again of the sure, of, of, of those boxes or of the structure? So here, so here's the perfect. Let's go. Perfect. Yeah. So this is this is kind of a reasonable overall structure, uh, overall view. So, so the the we're kind of, if you will, we're looking at this from the northeast, and um, the trail, uh, the 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 trail in our portion of the trail, indeed, and throughout the, the, along the majority of the entire Del Rio Trail, runs straight north south. So we're kind of looking at this from from the northeast. Um, so you see how, you know, th these types of open ledges, uh, right, need to face north. They face north on both of these boxes, right, even though other features on the boxes might differ a little bit, right? So so there's a certain amount of, of repetition and consistency, um, but overall, the idea of, of these being wayfinding devices in our mind is about them being basically the same thing repeated with relatively minor variations between them. That's great. Thank you. Um, and I, you know, and and again, <laughs> whether it was wayfinding or gathering space, you know, the idea was, you know, just to kind of separate those out. And there have been many different approaches to, you know, what a way what white wayfinding might mean or gathering space. And we and just so you know, uh, and I think you all do know Jonathan and Michael, but everybody else knows that we are working to kind of create this this series of signage as well, um, working with our hopefully working with our city sign shop and other uh, partners. Um, and so we're, we're really looking forward to that. And I, I would personally look forward to have uh, especially that that diagram that you showed of the different birds native to or not necessarily native, but the, but what would would essentially be prevalent in this area. And, and I love the fact that if you go an hour more towards the coast, there's gonna be a whole different series of birds. Um, and, and I think that that kind of conversation around ecology is really important. And um, one that, um, you know, if art, you know, if public art can, can give an opportunity for that discussion, then that, to me, that's just a huge, a huge, huge benefit. Um, well, this is wonderful. I, uh, you know, we can um, stop the screen share for a sec. Let me just check and make sure if there's any other final questions. Uh, you, all, you all have done a wonderful job in presenting. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Jonathan and Michael, uh, for your presentation today. Um, thank you, everybody who who came out today um, for the uh, some of the selection panelists who are here. Thank you all for making the time. Uh, today and for uh, the OIC staff who have been a, a great support and uh, part of part of my team. Uh, really pre appreciate you uh, being here as well. We're gonna we're gonna conclude uh, our, our our second session now of these brown bag lunch um, presentations, and we will uh, we'll continue again tomorrow on Thursday um, at 12 p.m. Uh, where Atlas Lab will be presenting uh, their design proposal. So please uh, put that on your calendar and, and join us for tomorrow's presentation. Uh, with that said, um, thank you and we will see you all on the trail. Thank you very much.